Good afternoon. I'm here on the windward side of Oahu, just north of the town of Kaneohe. And in the background, you can see a small island just off the coast, which is known in the Hawaiian language as Mokoli'i. However, it's more commonly known as Chinaman's Hat because it sort of resembles a hat, don't you think? There's a children's story about a Chinaman who outgrew his hat and he floated over here to Hawaii and the people of Hawaii presented him with a brand new hat to fit his head, which is Chinaman's hat. Now, I have actually snorkeled out to the island on behalf of my little niece in search of this Chinaman. However, after swimming all the way around, looking under the water, I did not find any Chinaman. But I still tell her it's possible that he's hiding in a cave somewhere. It's interesting how little islands like this can be formed off of the coast of Hawaii. There are many of them, and this is probably one of the more interesting shaped islands. In today's lecture, we don't talk about island formation, but we talk about solution formation. So stay tuned for this. Aloha. Good day. To begin this lecture on solution formation, let's ask a simple question. What happens when a solution forms? Now to answer this, let's look at the simple case where one gas dissolves with another gas. I've drawn here two situations for you to see. The first shows you the two gases before the solution has formed, and the second after the solution has formed. Before the solution has formed, we have the two gases being separated from one another inside of some container, and they're separated by some removable barrier. We could be talking about hydrogen and oxygen, for instance. Now, this is a more organized configuration for the gas particles to be in. After all, the hydrogen particles are separated from the oxygen particles. And organized configurations are described as low entropy configurations. An analogy would be papers of different types being separated from one another by putting them into their respective folders. So that is also a more organized configuration for the papers. Once we remove this barrier and we wait a little while, we'll observe the second situation where the particles have been mixed together and the solution has formed. And this is a less organized configuration for the particles to be in, and we describe this as being high entropy. If you carry the paper analogy further, we can imagine taking all of the papers out of their folders and just mixing them together. That would also be a less organized configuration for the papers, and it would also be described as high entropy. So, again, what happens when the solution forms? Before we answer that, let's make a quick note that no intermolecular forces are involved. There is nothing that is pulling these particles to mix together. There are no forces involved here. So once we remove this barrier, what happens? Well, the simple answer is that the gases just mix. Okay, that begs the next question. Why do they mix? Now these two questions often come together in science. What happens? And once you answer that, you ask why does it happen? The first question is usually answered inside of the laboratory. And the next question, why, is usually answered at your desk. The second question requires a little bit more thought. And so if we think about this process, we have a solution being formed here. Why does it form? Once we remove this barrier, why does that happen? Well, the answer is that stuff just mixes. You see, with the barrier in place, these gas particles are moving around. And they're moving around within the confines of the right-hand side of this container. And same thing with the other gas particles. They're moving around in the confines of the left-hand 
side of the container. However, once we remove the barrier, there's nothing that prevents the particles from filling up the entire container, and that's what happens. It just mixes together. You see, it's the random particle motion that leads to a mixed configuration. Now, this mixed configuration is actually a more probable configuration for the particles to be in. You see, once we remove the barrier, the oxygen particles do not still hang out on the right-hand side of the container and the hydrogen particles on the left-hand side of the container. Although that could happen, it's very unlikely. A more likely and more probable situation is that they will fill up the entire container. So mixing occurs because it's likely to happen. It's the random particle motion that makes it happen. Well, mixing is actually a very natural phenomena. When you have particle motion, then mixing pretty much automatically happens. And there are other examples for this as well. You see, mixing is spontaneous, which means it happens without any outside help. There are no forces that are required for mixing to happen. For instance, if you open a bottle of perfume on one side of the room, once you open it, the perfume is going to evaporate uh, more easily, and those perfume particles will eventually fill up the room, and someone on the other side of the room would eventually smell the perfume. And that's because the particles are also moving around. It's that random motion of the perfume particles that will eventually work their way towards the other side of the room. Another example would be smoking a cigarette. Now, thank God I don't smoke anymore. However, when I did smoke, if I lit up a smoke and smoked inside of a classroom, for instance, then eventually the students would smell the smoke or, and also they would see it. And that's because the smoke particles moving around would work their way towards the other side of the room. Now it takes a little while for gas particles to work their way from one side of the room towards the other side, and that's because of all of the collisions that they go through as they make their way towards the other side of the room. But it, it will eventually happen. The gas will mix. Another example would be spilling a bucket of marbles. If we tip over some bucket of marbles and they spill onto the floor, well they're going to mix all around throughout the floor. They're not going to just spill onto one half of the floor. No, they're going to fill up the entire floor because that's the most probable situation for the marbles to be in. It's very unlikely that the marbles, once you tip them over, would spill into uh, some weird configuration like maybe the shape of a circle or maybe the shape of a cat or some other configuration. Although that's possible, it's not very likely. You see, when no other forces are involved, mixing just occurs. Now, there are other situations of questionable categorizing of mixing as spontaneous. The first one would be knocking over a beehive. Suppose you have a beehive inside of the classroom. I wouldn't want to teach in that classroom. However, if you knocked over that beehive, maybe a careless student bumped into it, well then you'd have a bunch of angry bees and those bees would exit the beehive and they'd fly around mixing throughout the room wreaking havoc. However, that's not happening by itself because after all, those bees have little brains that are telling them to go find the culprit who knocked over their home. So. It doesn't really happen automatically, even though it is mixing. There are other forces involved. Another example of questionable categorizing would be shoppers at a holiday sale. Uh, you might imagine some store clerk opening the doors at the beginning of a holiday sale and the shoppers come mobbing through, uh, knocking each other over. Well, they're mixing throughout the store. However, again, they have little brains 
that are telling them to go find the item on sale before anybody else does. So there are other forces at work here. The last example shows a situation when mixing does not occur, and that's where boys and girls are at their first school dance, and they pretty much stay separated from one another. Now, if this were boys and girls on the playground, they would be all around mixed throughout the playground. However, once you put them in the school dance situation, then they don't really want to do that until maybe you have one brave boy and girl get up and dance, and then the rest might do that. However, the other forces at work here are telling them not to mix together. So these last three, uh, there are other forces at work. However, if no other forces are involved, then disorder among the particles increases. That's when mixing occurs, when no other forces are involved. And we could say that the entropy of the particles increases. Entropy is a measure of disorder, and so you could really say it either way. When a solution is formed and it involves either a solid or a liquid, or both, then other considerations need to be taken into account besides just the random particle motion that causes solute and solvent to be mixed, which is the case for the gas phase. The reason solids and liquids are different is because solid and liquid particles are held close to one another by the interaction forces that exist between the particles. And forming a solution, say by mixing a solid solute with a liquid solvent, means that interactions, at least some of them, will need to be broken and also new interactions formed. Now, interactions are not broken by themselves. It takes energy, so we need to consider the energy cost for breaking interactions as well as what energy might be released as the new interactions are being formed. So let's study the case of mixing a solid solute with a liquid solvent, and I think by studying this one case we'll better understand the energetics involved in solution formation. First of all, let's realize that breaking interactions costs energy. This will be a positive contribution of energy. And forming interactions releases energy, which will be a negative contribution to the energy. The entire solution process can be thought of as occurring in three separate stages, although these stages all happen at the same time when a solution forms, it helps us to think of them as occurring separately. We know that we'll have to separate the solute particles from each other because that's how they're going to be in the solution. So when you have a solid solute, those solute particles will end up being separated. And that's definitely going to cost energy. That will be a positive contribution. We can describe that as the enthalpy change of the solute will be positive. Now this can be quite large and positive whenever ionic compounds are involved. And that's because if you have an ionic compound as the solute, then cations and anions will need to be separated. So charges being involved means it's going to cost quite a lot of energy in that case. Now before this solute can be incorporated in the solvent, some of the solvent will also have to separate in order to make a little bit of room for the incoming solute. So you have to separate some of the solvent particles that will cost a little bit of energy, another positive contribution. We can describe that by saying the enthalpy change for separating some of the solute solvent is also positive. Now, the two can actually combine together, and when you combine solute and solvent, new interactions are formed, and when new interactions are formed, that's a stabilizing force, and energy ends up being released. This is a negative contribution. We can describe that by saying the enthalpy change for mixing the two 
is negative. And again, if it involves an ionic solute with water, this can be quite large and negative because of those ion-dipole interactions between the solute and the water. It can be quite strong interactions, so it can be quite large and negative in that case. When you add these three components together, you get the total energy involved in the solution process. You have two positive contributions and one negative contribution. So all of the three added together gives you the total enthalpy change for forming this solution. Now sometimes the positive outweighs the negative and other times the negative outweighs the positive. So I've listed here several examples that show both cases. The first one shows a solution process for potassium hydroxide solid mixing with water to form the dissolved ions, your potassium cation dissolved in water and your hydroxide anion dissolved in water. The total enthalpy change for the solution in this case is negative 57.61 kilojoules for dissolving one mole of potassium hydroxide. So this is a lot of energy that's being released to the surroundings. And the surroundings, meaning the container and your hand, if you're holding the container, would feel that energy coming off and it would be quite warm. So an exothermic process, meaning heat is being released. Other solution processes are endothermic. I've listed one right here. Silver nitrate is dissolved in water to form the silver cations and the nitrate anions that are dissolved. When this process occurs, 36.91 kilojoules of heat is absorbed. So it's an endothermic process and that heat is absorbed from the surroundings, means, meaning it's absorbed from the container and also from your hand if you're holding the container. So the container would feel quite cold because energy is being removed from your hand to make the solution form. Other situations involved small energy changes. Sucrose, C12H22O11, which is table sugar. When one mole of table sugar dissolves in water to form the dissolved molecules, no ions are involved here, it's just the entire molecule dissolved. When one mole of this dissolved, 6.09 kilojoules of heat is absorbed from the surroundings. So a little bit of energy is absorbed from the surroundings. The container might get a little bit cold. When one mole of sodium chloride dissolves in water to get the sodium cations and chloride anions, then only 3.88 kilojoules of energy is absorbed. And you probably couldn't even notice the energy change or the temperature change. It's interesting that some of these are positive, that some of these require energy for the solution process. Now, what makes the energy change positive? What makes the enthalpy of solution positive? Again, the reason it's positive is because the positive terms here outweigh the negative term. And that means rather strong interactions between the solute and solvent. It takes a lot of energy to separate them. And not, maybe not as much energy is released when they're combined. So strong solute and solvent interactions, but weak interactions between the two. Now, if these interactions are so strong, then why would the solution form in the first place? What causes them to break so the solution can form? Well, the reason the solution forms is because energy is absorbed from the surroundings. Don't forget that the solute and the solvent are surrounded by the container and whatever particles are outside the container. And the surroundings have a certain temperature and they can literally shake 
the solute and the solvent apart. It's the thermal energy of the surroundings, that molecular motion of the surroundings that kind of causes those interactions to break. So when energy is absorbed from the surroundings in these cases, for instance, energy is absorbed from the surroundings for the solution process, then the surroundings are kind of shaking the solute and the solvent apart so that they can mix together. And that's how stuff just mixes. This concludes our lecture on solution formation. In our next lecture, we'll discuss solution solubility, which is the maximum amount of solute that can be dissolved in a solvent. And we'll also discuss the factors that can affect the solubility, like the structure of the substances that are dissolving each other, and also the temperature and the pressure. And with the pressure, we'll discuss Henry's Law. So stay tuned for that. Aloha.